Welcome to lecture 27 on music and dance, uh, part of our unit of looking at the way art is a reflection of social and cultural trends for people. So we'll look at the way anthropologists look at music and dance, and then we'll talk about some um, examples from ancient Egypt. The study of music from an anthropological point of view is known as ethnomusicology. Um, so you could actually very much go into this um, as a field of study. It combines training as a musician with training as an anthropologist. And it turns out that's a really great uh, marriage of skill sets because anthropologists need to be able to understand music and understand how music works, instruments, uh, the production of sound. Um, but they're more interested not just in the way the sounds work and the, and the creation of them and the production of the music itself, as they are interested in what those notes, what those sounds say about a culture. Some cultures don't produce music that sounds like music in um, Western culture. And ethnomusicologists want to know why. Some cultures produce music on a five tone scale, a pentatonic scale. Why is that? Um, and so your training in music uh, combined with your interest in anthropology can help you look and, and answer that question. Anthropologists are interested in the role that music plays socially. So when people gather together to listen to music, what does it say about them? What does it reveal about the role that music plays in that society? Anthropologists are interested in the style. So why do certain styles appeal to certain societies? Why do styles change and how do they evolve over time? Music re reflects a culture's values. Um, cultures have judgments about what music is appropriate, what constitutes even music in that particular culture. So music shows up in all kinds of places that are linked to what that culture values and considers important. Ethnomusicologists can also be interested in composition. How do composers make music? What counts as a legitimate form of composition? What form should that composition take? And ethnomusicologists can be interested in performance. So when music is performed or produced, what are the circumstances under which it is performed and produced? What instruments are used? What occasions would we see that music uh, being performed? Who would be there? Um, what is the function of that music in that particular performance? So you can see here that ethnomusicology really combines um, appreciation for music um, and musical ability that you need to have as a musician with understanding the wider cultural and social um, settings in which that music exists. It turns out anthropologists have investigated um, musical production and looked at the ways in which societies over time have created music and they've discovered that many societies that are egalitarian, more equal, tend to have a particular style of music production, as opposed to societies like the United States, which is stratified, um, in which there is a definite um, class system and a hierarchy of, of social power. Egalitarian societies tend to have repetitious texts, same words, same phrases over and over again. 
non-repetitious texts, texts that are long and complicated and involved in stratified. Egalitarian societies don't mind slurred articulation. So you can bend the notes, as for example, in the production of jazz and blues, whereas a stratified society emphasizes precision. You must be right on rhythm, right in the center of the pitch. Egalitarian societies privilege um, group or communal singing, whereas stratified societies to emphasize solo singing. Egalitarian societies, it turns out, interestingly, um, like wide melodic intervals. There is a wide separation between the pitches, um, whereas stratified societies often focus on very narrow melodic intervals, very tiny differences between the pitches. So in an egalitarian society, ah, uh -huh, big interval there. Um, more stratified society, maybe something a little bit smaller. Uh -huh, Egalitarian societies, very simple songs with minor or few embellishments. So they're not very complicated melodically, but a stratified society might be much more elaborate with lots of embellishments. Think here, you know, singing a modern pop song versus singing opera. Egalitarian societies tend to have few instruments. Um, and stratified societies tend to have large numbers of instruments. So think like uh, um, an orchestra versus a small band. Egalitarian societies also value unison singing. So we're all gonna sing the same thing versus a stratified society emphasizing choral singing where everybody has a part and they have to produce their part in harmony with others. Um, so I find this a fascinating chart to look at um, in terms of stratified and egalitarian societies, but I also find it fascinating to think about the ways in which you see mixtures of both in, say, the United States. Uh, modern popular music um, tends to be repetitious. We're going to repeat the same phrasing over and over again. Baby, baby, baby. If I could pick on a piece from a few years back. Um, but you might also see um, in sort of modern music more solo singing than less solo singing. So the pop stars of today aren't producing large mass group singing in unison pieces. And even when they have a, a collaboration, a collab with somebody, um, it's one or two people, not a, not a whole group of folks. Um, instrumentation is also different in modern pop music. So you might actually have a large number of instruments, but they might all be digital. Um, and there might be a lot of mixing involved, uh, whereas production of um, what you would consider more sophisticated music um, might require lots of instrumentation to come together and uh, not require some mixing because they can't do it, it's live. So I think about this chart and I think about some of the ways in which you see evidence for these patterns being mixed, even in a society like the United States that is relatively stratified. What was Egyptian music like? We know that they had a relatively small range of instruments. Big emphasis on percussion. The hands are the first percussion instrument that people turn to. Little clappers that you can attach to your hands to produce sounds, drums, and a rattle-like instrument called a sistrum that I will show you on an upcoming slide. We know they had wind instruments, so flutes, and then a particular double pipe. So uh, an instrument that had two pipes 
in which one may have been used to produce a, a, a low sound or a drone sound over which the other pipe produced a melody. We know they had stringed instruments, so harps as we know them, lyres, um, a sort of handheld, think of it as a cross between a harp and a guitar almost. Early on in Egypt, we know men and women performed in musical ensembles, but it seems by the New Kingdom that music is a largely female uh, dominated occupation. And so all the representations of uh, singers and musicians in the New Kingdom tend to be mostly women, scantily clad women, in fact, as you can see from the picture. You would find these women performing for parties. You would find them performing um, perhaps in religious settings, um, such as saying goodbye to the deceased, perhaps at festivals. The goddess Hathor was known as the mistress of music. Um, so music does have a religious uh, relationship or a connotation in ancient Egypt. Um, and we do know some songs, though we don't know what they sounded like. We don't have an idea of the musical notation, so we don't know the pitches that would have been performed um, to know what the melody was. And I'll read to you uh, one of these songs, a song of the harper, which is a text you find across many periods in Egyptian history um, in tombs. Um, associated with the feast of the deceased. So when the person has died, uh, the song of the harper, um, you'll see is a reflection of, you know, what is a life well lived? Here's an example of a sistrum. You can see that it's an object with um, rows of metal um, attached that you would shake and produce a sort of clanging bell-like sound, which we still have um, the production of sounds like that today in modern music. Um, you can see here um, a harp. Um, there's a drum. There's a box lyre. You can see it's sort of like a harp and a guitar to get, come together. So you've got this box um, that produces an amplification of the sound as the person is plucking the strings. And you can see here in this image, um, the playing of all these instruments, um, we've got a double pipe. So, and of course, all these images reflect the fact that music tends to be a female dominated occupation in ancient Egypt, especially by the New Kingdom. Here's the song of the harper, usually associated with a blind man um, in the tomb. So here's a blind man uh, playing the harp, and he sings to the family. Um, as they are, you know, burying their loved one. Remember, enjoy yourself while you live. Put on fine linen. Anoint yourself with wonderful ointments. Multiply your fine possessions on earth. Be joyful and make merry. The, the sum of the story here, the sum of the song is, you know, you better live well while you can. Death is coming. Dance and music are often associated in ancient Egypt, though we don't always know um, clearly exactly how they are connected. Because very often the dancers and the musicians show up together, but they don't show up together in a way that allows us to interpret exactly um, what music is doing for the dancers. Though we presume the musicians are making something uh, sound-wise that would help the dancers articulate their dance. 
Dance, um, from an anthropological point of view, can have lots of different functions. Uh, it can be psychological. So we dance to cope with our tensions, our aggressive feelings. Our bodies move and sort of get out our emotions, our frustrations. Um, the suggestion that's about tension and aggression um, might ignore another function of dance uh, that I'll throw in here um, from my pastor growing up as a kid in the Southern Baptist Church, who once said that dance, um, particularly modern dance, is the vertical expression of a horizontal idea. And so dance can also have um, sexual suggestive connotations to it. It's about bringing people together um, who are going to enjoy the closeness that they experience. Um, and so psychologically, that might help them get out some tensions that they have. Dance can be political. Um, you can dance to show political values, political attitudes, dance for a particular leader. You know, um, dancing in the 1950s was subversive considering that many white and black kids were dancing together. Ooh, the shame of it in the age of Jim Crow. Um, when Elvis went to dance um, on television um, for the Ed Sullivan show, they didn't show him from the hips down because his dance was um, sexually suggestive and therefore it was rejecting the norms, the political and social norms of that time period. So your dance can be political um, in upholding the political and social norms, but you can also dance to be subversive. Dance can be definitely religious, swaying in time to the music, uh, raising your hands in worship, um, dancing for the God um, in Egypt. Certainly dance has religious um, connotations. Dance can be social, um, connecting people, bringing people together, celebrating things. If you've ever been to a concert and taken part in dancing at a concert or perhaps a mosh pit, you understand the social connection produced by dancing with others. Um, it's not a surprise that ancient Egyptians did dance for all those things that we just mentioned. Um, though there is the connotation for Egypt of dancing for burial because the importance placed on death and going into the next life, the afterlife. Um, so you will find dancers um, at burials and funeral processions dancing as, as for parties as a form of entertainment. Um, as this um, ostracon here shows a young girl doing an impressive uh, backbend uh, presumably to entertain the guests at a party. You see dancing at festivals. You see war dancing, sort of like a, a rhythmic display of our, our masculine power as we are getting ready to go out in war. We've got our bodies in sync through this dance. Um, think of, say, West African societies um, who dance uh, to prep for war, um, like Agbekor, a uh, dance there. Think of like the Hakka, um, a dance to intimidate your opponents as you're going about to go out on the field. Um, so def de definitely dance can have a uh, connotation of aggression. We know in ancient Egypt that dancing dwarfs and pygmies were highly valued. Dwarfs and pygmies in general were valued um, you might recall we talked about Pepe II's instructions uh, for a dwarf to be brought back to him and to be watched out and cared for and uh, make sure that 10 people watch over him while he sleeps and don't let him fall overboard. Um, we think that dwarfs um, have a connotation of the god Bess, which is a dwarf god, and, they're, and dancing for them is a way of warding off evil. Um, it has an apotropaic function or a protective function. Um, 
So definitely you will see them a lot in, in imagery for dance. And I would like to leave you with this thought about dance. Um, anthropologists are paying a lot of attention to something called embodied knowledge, which is information stored in your body. It is how your body knows how to move and do things without the need to think. Um, embodied knowledge in psychology would be called procedural knowledge, which is a sort of automatic um, set of skills that you put into place um, because your brain is wired to reproduce those movements and reproduce them well once you've learned them. So um, if you encounter this term in anthropology, um, note that it's kind of gaining a lot of Y currency to talk about the things that people know how to do with their bodies, um, like riding a bicycle, for example. Here are some dances in ancient Egypt. Um, Antifoker's tomb, his wife Senet, um, in Thebes. Um, so clearly some kind of rhythmic moving going in three different groups. We've got some people with hands on their chests um, and fists extended, but with their thumb out um, and a foot lifted. Other people with hands upraised, sort of like in a clapping motion. And then other people with feet upraised, but doing a double sort of finger gun pointing activity. What does it mean? We don't know. Here's the same scene, but in the actual tomb um, in color, um, showing these people doing whatever this dance is, whatever the meaning of this dance is um, for the function that it plays um, in this tomb. There's an interesting group of dancers in Egypt called the Mu, M-W-W -W or M-U-U, um, who wear these tall papyrus hat crowns and a special linen kilt. And they do some kind of specialized dancing, particularly in funeral contexts. And you can see here the Mu with their tall hats are doing this once again, lit foot raised, sort of like a kick, um, and then finger pointing of some kind. Who knows what that means, what the significance of it is, but presumably their, their bodies would embody this knowledge of how to do this dance and it would be connected to some special meaning um, in Egyptian funeral contexts. That has been our look at dance and music. We'll see you next time when we talk more about ancient Egyptian culture and society.